Well, you know what? I consider myself something of a pluviophile. Now, that isn't something kinky or perverted. It merely means that I'm a person who loves the rain. Someone who finds joy and peace of mind during rainy days. Are you one too? Do you enjoy those days when it's stormy and thundering outside? And you're inside in the warm? Well, this story might just turn you into a pluviophile if you're not one already. Well, my dear friends, it's Friday, we've made it to the end of the week, and I think you all deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I used to love jumping in puddles. Well, ever since I was a kid. Most people know it as just something they can do on a whim when walking down the sidewalk to school. But I've had a much different experience with it. You see, I can't just jump into, but through puddles into the other side. When I jump into a puddle, I'd fall through it and into a reverse dimension. A warped, cold mirror of my world. Now, the puddle must be formed by rain and must be no older than one day. If it's any shallower than up to my ankle, it will do nothing. Only my reflection can be seen in the puddle for the switch to take effect. Now, even if one of these three rules is broken, I will not go through. I discovered my ability when I was about twelve. <laughs> my parents were adamant that I stay inside during the rain, so I didn't have many chances to play in puddles until later in my childhood, and even then I was always with friends, so my reflection was never alone. The first time I jumped through, it was late in the day and starting to get dark. I was walking home from the playground with my friends, and I was lagging behind by about twenty feet. I saw a large puddle collected on the other side of the road from the rain that morning, and I decided to jump into it. As soon as the water made contact with my feet, I found myself in a cold, dark parody of my neighbourhood. I looked around for a moment before murmuring, Hello? to no one in particular. My voice was muffled and quiet, like I was underwater, but I could breathe fine. I moved my hand in front of my face. It was also hard to move, as if I were submerged. I started walking, slowly, toward where my friend stood just before I jumped. Everything was cold and quiet. Where my friends had stood, there were marks in the sidewalk, like shoe prints in the mud. I walked up to the nearest house, Mrs. Chambers, to look inside. In the place where she normally sat on her rocking chair was an old empty chair and two shoe prints that looked like they were from slippers rather than sneakers. I walked back over to my puddle, which looked more like an air bubble now, and I jumped on it. Immediately, I felt a splash beneath my feet, and I was back in my neighborhood, completely dry. I turned to look at my friends, who were exactly where I'd left them. They turned back to ask if I was coming, and I gave them a nod. I looked at Mrs. Chamber, and she sat, rocking in her chair as usual. I caught up with my friends and kept pace with them until I got to my block, where I took a right to get home. I said bye and started jogging. As soon as I got home, I was sat down for dinner. My dad had picked up a pizza on his way home from work, and my mom and sister were waiting for me at the table. During dinner, I told my family about my experience with the puddle, and they said, oh, I was just daydreaming, that I was tired after playing all day. I went to bed that day, sleepy and confused. I dreamed about that other dimension, about how empty and cold it was. I was stuck in it after my puddle had dried up, and I was lost. There was no one in my neighborhood, just shoe and footprints on the ground everywhere. As I wandered through the dark, desolate streets, I heard a low rumbling behind me. There was a large cloud of black ink approaching. 
I turned around and ran in the opposite direction. The watery atmosphere hindered my sprint, though, and the black ink was approaching faster. My feet started to lose grip on the asphalt, and I began to fall in slow motion. As I hit the ground with a dull thud, I turned over and was engulfed by the swirling black wave. It felt like a trillion icicles were being driven into my body from all sides. I was thrown into the air and slammed against buildings, trees, and finally the ground. As I slammed against the ground, the furious winds and rushing water suddenly stopped, and a large figure walked from behind the dark veil of the ink. It was at least nine feet tall, and had four arms and four legs. If you can imagine a tall, skinny spider standing upright, that's what I saw. It had three orange, gleaming eyes that blinked independently of each other. Its nose was non-existent, and its mouth was a large oval filled with razor-sharp metal fragments. The whole thing was surrounded by a glowing darkness. It's hard to describe. And it was hard for my brain to comprehend. Imagine the color of a black light, completely dark but somehow still emitting light. The demonic creature was just about to reach me before I woke with a jolt. I was sweating profusely and I was shaking. I quickly shook my hand in front of my face, feeling that I was indeed surrounded by air and not water. I got up to go to the bathroom and jumped when I stepped into a pool of water left on the floor from my mum's shower. The water was cold, and it sent shivers up my back when my foot touched it. I used the bathroom and tried to fall back asleep, but couldn't. The next day I planned to go back to the puddle, but it had already evaporated from the blazing summer sun. It was about a week and a half before the rain fell again and I got my chance to further explore this dark reflection of the earth. As soon as the rain stopped and I was permitted to go outside, I put on my shoes and ran to the nearest puddle, the one in the middle of the sidewalk by my house. There was a large crack there from where the water main had burst and disturbed a lot of soil before being patched up. I looked into the puddle and took a deep breath before making a mighty leap into it nothing happened. I jumped up and down it a couple of times before examining it. It was only about half an inch deep. So I ran to another larger puddle and jumped into that one as well. Still, nothing. I was starting to believe that, well, I had just imagined it, before spotting a larger puddle near the street corner. The drain was clogged with leaves so the puddle was roughly six feet by three feet and was about five inches deep. I ran and jumped into that one and actually gasped in surprise when I fell through to the other side. Although it was still cold, it was definitely not as cold as it had been the week prior. The water filled my mouth as I took a deep inhale of the stuff. It tasted like water that had been sitting in pipes too long, like copper. I could still breathe fine, but my movement was slow. I began walking back to my now empty house. The road had a glimmering look to it, like when you'd look at the water when there is a light on the other side. The whole street was silent. About five minutes later I began moving and I finally arrived at my house. Walking up the steps, I noticed the whole house was dark. The porch lights, which were always on, were now dead. The lights in the kitchen where my mother once sat were shut off, and the TV my dad was watching was off too. I opened the door and walked in. Trying the light switch, I found that it did nothing. The house was bound to remain dark. I took out my dad's old flip phone he gave me for emergencies and tried turning it on. It usually took about a minute to power up, so I set it on the table and began walking through the hall. I looked up the stairs, and all the doors in the upper half of the house were shut, covering the hall in an impenetrable darkness. 
The thought of the monster I'd seen in my dream made me shudder, and I began walking to the kitchen counter. The generic fruit bowl was missing from its place on the island, and the ceiling fan was shut off. Opening the fridge, I found that it too was empty, along with the pantry. Walking into the den, I found that the large room was empty and the chair my dad sat in to watch the news was empty too. On the floor in front of it, there were two large footprints. Walking back into the kitchen, I saw another set of footprints in front of the stool near the island. Suddenly, a single muffled beep echoed through the silent house. I turned back to the hall where I'd left the flip phone. I ran back up to it as quickly as I could. Taking it into my hand, I opened it up and looked at the inner screen. Displayed on it was the large, bold text, Low Battery. I murmured something to myself about charging it, then unlocked the old device. The clock that normally displayed the time of day now read 0000 AM. Midnight. I clicked the arrow buttons on the keyboard until I reached the camera icon, and then pressed call. The app opened, and I turned on the flash. I took a quick photo of the dark upstairs hall, and the flash lit up the doors and landing in shimmering detail. The light temporarily blinded me, so I took another. About three photos in, my phone displayed the text, Low battery, flash disabled. I opened the Photos app and looked at the images I'd taken. The images were foggy and not very well focused, but I could make out a large figure standing in the landing way. I quickly looked up from my phone, but saw nothing of the sort. I looked back down and moved to the next photo. The same figure was there, but now it was on the top step. I moved on to the last photo. And the figure was now on the second to top step. I looked back up, but saw nothing there. At that moment, I heard a loud rumbling. They say that everything is louder underwater, and that definitely applied here. I could feel the vibrations of my body, as if I were backstage at a loud concert. I took off running, back down the hall, and out of my empty house. I ran as fast as I could through the cold, watery world, back to my saviour, that puddle of air. As soon as I reached it, I jumped full force into it and made a splash as I landed, back in my air-filled world. I was completely dry, other than my shoes and pant bottoms. I quickly looked around and again waved my hand in front of my face to verify that I was indeed surrounded by air ran as fast as I could back to my house, and slammed the door behind me as soon as I got inside. I looked at my brightly lit house, and my mum, who was sat at the kitchen island, reading a magazine. My dad sat in the den, watching some cops and robbers show. I quickly opened my phone and attempted to turn it on, but it was dead. I ran to tell my mum what had happened, and she said that I'd been gone for less than two minutes and to get my wet shoes off the floor that she had just cleaned. I ran back into the hall and took my shoes off, before running back into the kitchen to try and convince my mom otherwise. After several fruitless attempts, she finally sent me to my room for an hour for lying to her. I, of course, knew otherwise. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I gazed up to the hallway above. All of the doors in the upstairs portion of the house were closed. I trod the stairs slowly and cautiously, making sure that there was nothing standing on the second step from the top, like there had been in the mirror world. As I reached the third step from the top, I looked down onto the stair in front of me and wondered if I should take it. I decided to skip it, and I jumped over it onto the last step. I walked over to my room on the far side of the hall. Along the way, I opened all the doors so as to light up this empty hall. Once I got into my room, I plugged in my phone and waited for the battery to charge. Again, 
It was an old phone, so it took about 30 minutes just to have enough power to boot up. While I waited, I looked out the window onto the backyard. I lived in a small fence neighborhood, mostly with old people, but with some kids my age. One such kid, Anthony, was walking down the sidewalk in front of my backdoor neighbor's house. Anthony and I were friends, but, well, not best friends. We would hang out on occasion, but never really got to know each other. My friend Josh took the slot of best friend. He and I spent the summer biking along the curved paths and twisted sidewalks of the suburbs. I looked over the roads of the neighborhood, and all of the small pools of water collected on them. After a little while of mindless staring into these puddles, my phone beeped three times, indicating that it was charging. I walked up to my desk and sat down. Unlocking the old phone, I opened the Photos app again and took another look at the pictures I'd taken of my hallway. The photos were now just of my regular hallway, bright and free of the dark figure. This couldn't have been possible. I knew what I'd seen, and where I went wasn't made up in my head, so how had the photos been changed? I scrolled through all three photos, and determined that every one of them had been altered to display the normal world. Was I dreaming? I had to find out. After my timeout was over, I went to the cabinet in the TV room to retrieve a Canon DSLR camera. My sister had got it for her birthday, but never really used it. I went back outside to the large puddle, but found it missing. Somebody had walked by and cleaned out that drain intake, and my puddle had drained away. I walked up and down the neighborhood until I found a large puddle by the playground. Now, there were already one or two people playing on the playset, but no one near the puddle. I walked up to it, and my friend Anthony, who I'd seen before, came up to me from the swings. He asked what I was doing with the camera, and I asked him to videotape me. He obliged and took the camera. After he figured out how to start a video, he pointed the lens at me and gave me a signal. I took a mighty leap into the puddle, bracing myself for the frigid waters of the mirror world. As I hit the puddle, my friend said that it was a cool splash, but asked why he had to record it. <laughs> I didn't go through. I told Anthony to back up a couple of feet, and he did. I tried again, but still nothing. He lowered the camera and asked if he could go. I took the camera back from him and said my thanks. He walked away, and I, well, I stared intently into the puddle. As soon as he was behind the playset, I started recording my own footage and took another mighty leap. This time, I went through. The cold water stung my body, and the coppery taste was stronger than ever. I called out to my friend in a muffled voice, but my dull voice was met with no response. I walked to behind the playset where I'd last seen Anthony, but in that spot was a single footprint, like he was in the middle of taking a step. I looked down at the camera in my hand, still recording. I pointed it at the footprint, and then made a slow 360, getting the whole area in my video. I walked back over to the puddle of air and recorded that as well. I then stopped the recording and took a few HD photos of random things. The footprint, the sky, the puddle, and then I pointed the camera at myself. I pressed the shutter button and heard a soft click as the device captured my likeness. I then hopped through the puddle and landed back in my world again. Anthony peeked out from behind the equipment and gave me a quizzical look. I told him to come here and to look at what I'd taken pictures of. I opened the viewer and scrolled over the four most recent pictures. Once again, the pictures were of the normal world, not the mirror one. The footprint was just of Anthony's shoe. The sky 
was one of light blue, and the photo of the mirror world's air puddle was of my world's water puddle. Before I had the courage to scroll to my selfie, Anthony asked how I managed to get a picture of his foot from behind the playground equipment. I said, I didn't know, and he just gave me a concerned look and walked back to the swings. I called for him to wait up, but he kept walking. I slowly raised the camera to my face and moved over to the last photo, my selfie. When I saw it, I gasped. The photo was set in my world, but it wasn't of me, at least not me from my world. It was a bloated and waterlogged version of me, standing there in the middle of the puddle, staring with foggy and glazed over eyes into the camera. Its mouth hung open, exposing the rotting and dislodged teeth that filled its decrepit jaw. The hair was missing in patches, and was thin and stringy. I quickly deleted the image, not wanting to see it any more. The video popped up on the screen to fill its place. I pressed play, and the video began. Yet again, it was set in the normal world, but everything was frozen in time. I had simply jumped into the puddle, but as soon as my feet hit the water, time froze. It stayed frozen like this for some time before the video ended. I watched the video of the puddle, and my feet suspended in air as if I was standing on water. The video took just as long to play back as it did to record. I'd assumed that I just wouldn't be able to record me going through the puddle. I placed the camera in my pocket and stared intently into the puddle. After the nightmare and the haunting image, any sane person would have just forgotten about the whole experience and continued their life. <laughs> For some inexplicable reason, I was attracted to this mirror world. I tried to suppress this attraction for as long as possible, before I finally caved in and decided to go back. It had been about three months since the playground incident, and the need to explore the mirror world was eating me alive. Curiosity grew today, and, well, I could no longer help it. The next time it rained was about two days after I'd chosen to go back. This time I took a lighter, a bottle of food dye, and a few balloons. I was going to test out this mirror world and see what it really was. As soon as the rain started, I ran to collect my tools and ran outside and to the playground. The only surefire hole that was big enough for a good puddle to form was there. I would have to travel around four blocks to get to it, and I had two options. I could go through the dense forest in the middle of the neighborhood, or I could go around it and waste an extra ten minutes. I opted for the latter, since the dense woods scare me. I'd gotten lost in them more than once or twice when I was little, and I didn't want to repeat the experience. As expected, the playground was empty, due to the heavy downpour. I filled two balloons with my own breath, but left a third empty. I braced myself, holding all my stuff, and jumped into the shallow puddle. As I opened my eyes and took a deep inhale of breath, that cold stung me once again. I had gone through. I released one of the air-filled balloons, and it dropped rather than floating like I would have expected it to. I took the other air-filled balloon and attempted to inhale that air that I knew it was full of. As I took a big gulp of air into my water-filled lungs, I felt a sharp pain in my chest. The air burned the inside of my throat and lungs. It felt like I was breathing mustard gas. I quickly exhaled the air, which slowly sank to the dirt ground and dispersed. Taking a sharp inhale of water, I felt relief as the cold liquid touched my throat. After catching my breath, I filled the third balloon with water from my lungs and set it aside, next to the puddle of shimmering air. I was suddenly aware of the small bubbles floating down from the dark sky. 
there were bubbles of air dropping to the ground, like inverted rain. I took the food color bottle out of my pants pocket and opened the lid. I squirted a small amount into the water surrounding me, and it dispersed just as expected. The lighter, as expected, did not light either. I flicked it a few times, but no sparks came from the roller. I checked it when I grabbed it, and it worked fine. I popped the air balloon by my foot by stomping on it, and the air fell and dispersed on the ground before disappearing. I looked around, and it was much darker than before, likely due to the rain, or rather, air storm that's raging overhead. I jogged to the nearest building and hid under the porch overhang. There was no way that I was leaving now. This was getting interesting. I needed to know what came next. Suddenly, a brightness filled the dense atmosphere as a bolt of bright blue lightning struck the radio tower that stood in the distance. The whole sky was lit up, and the visible buildings were cast in a blue light. Another bolt struck the ground, but this time closer to where I stood. The wind was quickly picking up, and I wasn't ready for the sudden drop in temperature and spike in air bubbles. The air bubbles that flew around me stung my throat, just the same as the air from the balloon. I had to lift my shirt over my mouth and breathe slowly just to prevent air from reaching it. My heart was pounding, and another bolt of electricity illuminated the sky and cast bright outlines of trees and houses onto the shimmering ground. I tried the knob of the door that I was standing by, but it was locked, and there were no windows close enough to the ground for me to climb through. I was going to have to run to the next house over. Having to walk against both the current of the water and the strong force of air penetrating my mask, well, my movement was slow. The lightning came incrementally closer, and it was going to be right on top of me if I didn't move inside soon. I finally reached the house after what felt like hours, and I managed to get the door unlocked. As soon as I turned the lever-shaped handle, the door swung open due to the strong current pressing against it. I fell through the open doorway and tried my best to close the door behind me. <laughs> if you've ever tried to close a door against 30 miles an hour wind, you know how hard it can be. Now I imagine trying to close it against the torrents of rushing water that surrounded me. I couldn't close it fully, and the door swung back and knocked me in the head. A bright flash filled my vision, and I saw stars for a few moments before my mind cleared. I gathered myself, I ran up the stairs into the closest room to my left. As I got inside the pink room, I closed the door and leaned against it. I was exhausted. I looked around and realized that this would have been the room of a young girl. The walls were pink, and a small wooden bed frame stood against the far wall, just to the left of the window that overlooked the street. I got up and walked to the window. It was still intact somehow, and I looked through the foggy glass. Outside, the storm was raging stronger than ever before. The lightning struck just a few blocks away from the house I was in. It blinded me for a moment, and, as I recovered my vision, I saw that a large pillar of black smoke was rising from the places it struck. Imagine the blackest thing you've ever seen. Now, this pillar of smoke would easily have been many times darker. It filled the water and swirled through it with a current, not seeming to affect it at all. Every place the lightning struck had a pillar of smoke rising from it. Once more, the blue lightning made contact with the ground, but this time it hit the asphalt of the street that ran in front of the house. Immediately, a cavernous crack formed in the ground and made the mirror world quake. I could smell something similar to ozone, but not quite like it. The coppery taste in my mouth intensified as the black smoke filled the crack and rose out of it to fill the street, beginning to surround the house. I moved without thinking. I ran to the door, flinging it open, and ran down the hall to the other side of the house. I jumped through a glass window, shards cutting me as I went. I fell a good ten feet before hitting the ground, 
chest first with a dull thump. I felt bruises forming, but knew that I hadn't broken anything. The water had allowed me that much. I sprinted as fast as I could through the raging storm that was following me. The black smoke was quickly gaining on me as I ran. I made it into the next street over before another bolt of lightning split the sky. Somewhere about four blocks down, another dark smoke pillar shot up into the sky in slow motion. The pillar behind me was slowly rising up and away from me. I slowed down and looked around. The storm was still raging, but not nearly as bad. I began to walk back to my puddle, the air bubbles stinging my eyes. I was about 50 feet from it before realizing that it had been engulfed by the black pillar. I wondered how long it would have taken to find a new puddle, but just then, the pillars began to expand. All of the pillars that I could see were beginning to grow. I didn't have the chance to escape from the one nearest to me, and I was engulfed before my feet even started moving. The black blinded me, and I felt like I was running into oblivion. A thunderous boom sounded throughout the darkened waters, and I toppled over. Something had tripped me. Whatever it was that tripped me was grabbing at my leg, like it needed help. I hadn't seen another living thing in the mirror world, and I wasn't going to start now. I kicked at the thing with all my might, and it slowly released its grip on my leg. As I managed to squirm free, I got up and began running once again. I was completely disoriented at this point, and had no clue which way was forward and which was back. Another loud rumble filled the water. The smoke was slowly clearing, and I was beginning to regain my vision. The monster from my dream emerged from the black cloud just behind me. The creature was much larger than it had been in my dream, and more detailed. I had dreamed something similar to this thing, but nothing that can really compare. This creature had many hundreds of limbs, all spider-like in structure. They squirmed and twisted in unnatural ways that made them look like they pierced the fourth dimension. As its limbs twisted and shot, its torso warped and barbed to mimic my running. The thing was a twisted and morphed parody of any creature that would exist in the normal world. The face was covered in many millions of black and red eyes, and the mouth looked like it was a tear in the universe, exposing cosmic hatred. It crawled on close to thirty of its gangly limbs, reaching unbelievable speed in this watery world. I had no idea what to do. It was quickly gaining on me. As soon as I got out of the black smoke completely, the creature stopped. It hid behind the now thinning veil of smoke, before disappearing along with it. I stood in shock for a few moments, before collapsing onto the ground in exhaustion. I was safe for now, but I had no clue where I was, or if I could even leave this wretched place. I slowly got up onto my feet after a while of laying and staring at the darkened sky. The storm had stopped after that thing disappeared, and I was ready to go. I looked around, taking in my surroundings. I was near the edge of a dense cluster of trees and bushes. This was the forest where I'd gotten lost as a kid. If I wanted to get back to my house, I would need to go through or around it. I honestly didn't care at this point, and I decided, after having encountered that demonic creature, that I was going to spend as little time as possible in the mirror world. Rather than going back to the puddle in the playground, I decided I would look for a different one and hope that it would have the same effect. As I reached the edge of the woods, I had a quick moment of hesitation before proceeding. The woods were only about a quarter mile long, but the trees were so closely packed in that I felt like I was walking for hours. Every now and then a twig or thorn or branch would catch on my clothes or skin and rip through. Often, 
It was just a scratch. But on one occasion I wasn't looking where I was heading, and I stumbled straight into a thorn bush. That cut me up pretty nicely, but nothing too much to be worried about. Then the cut started to ache, and I looked down at my leg to find it had turned grey and swollen around where the bush had cut my skin. Now, I had somewhat expected something like this, but it still shocked me when it came. I stumbled upon the spot where I'd gotten lost as a child, and the memories came rushing back in terrifying detail. I'd been lost for no more than an hour when I was younger, but back then it felt like days. My mum had eventually found me, and she scolded me heavily for ripping up my clothes in the bushes. This time, my mom wouldn't find me. The only thing that could was the creature I'd encountered in the smoke. As I stumbled across the clearing, my mind played movies in my head of when I'd tried to run away. I'd run into the woods thinking I could survive. I was walking around in circles in the clearing when my mom found me, but this time... I wouldn't get lost. All I had to do was walk in a straight line. <laughs> Easier said than done. I often got stuck behind a large bush of thorns or a thick patch of vines and had to turn and go around, losing my direction. I made it to the same clearing before I began to panic. I recognized it as the same place that I was in earlier in my childhood. I suddenly became very self-aware and realized how exposed I was standing on the edge of the clearing. It was taking far longer than I had hoped it would, not only because I had to walk through so many shrubs, but also because it felt as if I was walking in molasses. I suddenly got an idea, and began looking for the moon, or sun, or any celestial body. If I could find even one, I would be able to find my cardinal directions. This was the moment... I realized that the sky was completely void of anything. No moon, no sun, no stars, no clouds. It was like being in a clear lake and looking down, only I was looking up. Then it struck me. The ground. I pushed fallen leaves out of the way to expose a shimmering dirt ground. It had the same effect as if you were in the same lake and looked up. There was one spot that was brighter than the rest, and I knew it had to be the sun. After figuring out where it would be in a mirror, I got up and began walking east toward my house. About ten minutes later, I caught a glimpse of the tree line. I began doing that awkward underwater run to get there as fast as I could. Still, it took me a long time. When I broke through the edge of the forest, I gathered myself and took a good look at my arms and legs. They were horribly scratched and turning swollen grey. I began letting out what must have resembled a scream, but was muffled to a gurgle. If I'd been in the normal world, those cuts would have been mirror scratches, not even needing band-aids. The water was beginning to decay me from just below my skin. I needed to find an air puddle soon. If not, I would be fully rotated within a few hours. I ran to the street corner closest to the tree line and found a sewer drain. Unfortunately for me, it was clear and there were air bubbles flowing into it. I looked both ways down the street, but every drain was clear. I began to improvise and ran back to the tree line. Gathering up leaves and twigs and branches, I began clogging up the storm drain. It took me a good long time, and I tripped a few times, landing on my chin. But, eventually, I managed to clog the drain, and the air puddle began to form again. My only concern now was that it wouldn't have the same effect as the puddle near the playground. Just as the air reached the top of the soles of my shoes, a bolt of blue lightning touched down just a few hundred feet away. I could feel the static charge make my fingers tingle. The thunder that must have echoed afterward popped my eardrums. The pain was intense, but I needed to stay focused. 
The storm was growing larger again, and the puddle of air began to shimmer as it got larger under me. A large plume of black smoke began rising from the touchdown zone, and I knew what was coming next. The figure began to emerge from the spoke but it didn't break the barrier of the inky pillar. The dark cloud grew ever closer, and with it, that watery monster. I looked down to see the puddle was just about large enough. I stepped up onto the sidewalk and got ready to make a mighty leap. Just as the cloud began to consume me, I jumped. At that moment, everything stopped. The storm died, and the creature was gone. I could taste the copper in my mouth still, but it wasn't nearly as strong. I opened my eyes to see that I was standing on the curb in my neighborhood, in the light sprinkle of a passing storm. I looked down at my arms and legs to see the scratches and cuts begin to bleed, but it was a bright red blood, not gray, and no swollen mark. The coppery taste got stronger, and I spit it out onto the sidewalk. Blood. I must have bitten my tongue when I tripped and fell on my chin. The sun was beginning to peek out from behind the veil of clouds that now covered the sky. I felt such relief that I began to sob. Just then, Mrs. Chambers drove by on her way back from the grocery store and asked if I was okay. I told her that I would be fine, and she offered me a ride home. On the short drive from the forest to my house, she asked why I was so cut up, and why I was standing in a puddle crying, and I just told her that I'd run through the woods and got lost. <laughs> she wouldn't believe the real story. In those moments, I couldn't believe in myself. You know what? I don't think I like the rain very much anymore. Well, what a story that was. Quite incredible. Another one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit that I set up for you so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all to you on a cold winter's night like tonight. Well, my dear friends, if you've got a story, please consider submitting it. I do read a lot of them. More than 150 submissions now I think I've read on the channel and it always gives me great pleasure to do so. Well, we've made it to another weekend. Hope you're not working too hard. All those of you that are, or you're out there on the road driving, I know a lot of uh, long distance drivers listen to these stories, and I hope it helps the time pass a little bit more easily. Well, enough for me for one evening, but of course I will be back again next week. A week when I'll be celebrating my third anniversary on YouTube. Three years, can you believe it? Oh my god. Well, until then, sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>